So here's the thing. We don't know much about the J20 and probably we won't know much for a while. However, there are several analysts that are following its development and now there is enough open source intelligence to have a reasonable discussion, even without Otis hacking into Chinese computers. The beginning of the development started in the 90s. The first flight happened in 2011. The first delivery started in 2017. The first combat brigade was formed in 2018, but in 2019 the J-20B started being delivered. Since then, it is estimated that two more brigades have been equipped with the aircraft, which this would mean probably between 120 and 150 units. Yeah, I know, it seems a lot, but Chinese do everything very quickly, so it's probably not impossible. Anyway, we don't know the mix between the two versions. And exactly when I am preparing the video, here it appears. The first good look at the dual-seater version. The configuration is twin-engine Delta Canard with a long and slender lifting body. This is an interesting configuration from an aerodynamic point of view since it has the potential of still enjoying the advantages of the Delta Canard, but also being quite efficient because the aerodynamic surfaces are kept relatively small. The aircraft seems long, very long. With the wings placed so far back, one might actually question the fact that the aerodynamic center is actually on the back of the center of gravity, which is something necessary because the design is a relaxability design. However, if you observe the aircraft plan form and you keep the canards and the lifting body in consideration, probably doesn't seem so far-fetched. The aircraft gives the impression of being long if seen from the side because the canopy is very small and also the vertical stabilizers are quite small. And the vertical stabilizers are quite small because they are divided in two sets of two. There are two classic stabilizers um, above the aircraft canted outwards, but also two smaller fins below the aircraft pointing outwards as well. From the overall proportions, it seems a very long aircraft, but in fact, it is shorter than the Sukhoi 35 or the Sukhoi 57. Well, not by much, but it is shorter. The canard configuration seems to be a relatively classic loose coupled canards, uh, which should provide a good maneuverability together with the leading edge root extensions of the small delta wing. Overall, this configuration should be relatively resilient to departure. However, it seems that the aircraft is not capable of post-stall maneuvering, and even the maximum angles of attack are not that extreme as we have seen in other modern fighters. Analyzing an aircraft structure from the outside is always a game of conjectures, but we love it, so let's do it! Structurally, it seems that the aircraft is built with a single central torsion box, with the bulkheads changing shape to accommodate the engines, and the wing spars are probably blended with the rear bulkheads. The weapons bay is between this central box and the canards, and since the weapons bay is an opening, the structural rigidity is actually compromised by the opening, uh, either for torsion or for bending. Since the canards impose aerodynamic loads to the structure, placing the canard in that position means that either there have been some weight penalties to add material to restore the rigidity, or maybe there are some limitations to the use of the canards. For example, a heavy asymmetric maneuver can place a heavy torsion load on the structure and basically bend or twist the aircraft. 
Half of the weight of the aircraft is aluminum, about 30% is titanium and only 20% is composites. So despite the fact that it is a relatively modern design, it is not one of those plastic planes. The J20 seems to be covered in some sort of rather absorbing material, but the whole structure is definitely designed with stealth in mind. We have the classical ridge on the forward part of the fuselage. There is plan for alignment. There are no straight angles. So all the four tail surfaces are canted outwards. The air intakes are diverterless intakes. The surface is relatively smooth. Panels and openings are all serrated. All of these are classic style design features. And obviously the other and the obvious question is, why canards on a style design? These are usually very radar reflective features because they have a straight angle with the fuselage and when they are close coupled they promote the bouncing of electromagnetic radiation between the canards and the wing. In the case of the J20 though, the canards have a very prominent dihedral and the fuselage at the insertion point is inclined downward. So it is impossible to say how stat an aircraft is just by looking at it, but in this case, it seems that the canard problem has been at least mitigated. It is also worth noting that from the side, the aircraft profile is quite low. This means that the surface that is exposed to the radar energy is also relatively low if compared with the overall size of the aircraft. No I'm, no, I'm really not covering this because there is too much confusion. So it seems that the aircraft is using two different types of engines and probably a third will be available from 2023 or 2025. But the names, the versions and the features of all these engines are basically all over the place. The one thing that seems certain is that the current aircraft doesn't have the final engine, so it should be considered underpowered. However, it seems to be underpowered in the same way the Suhoi 57 is. Now is very good, but in the future it will become great. We do have some official numbers derived from some signs at the latest expo where the JU-20 has been present, but that's hardly a reliable source. I still think we should procure the manuals, sir. Otis, don't you have anything else to do? No, sir. Okay, while you're here, please show the specification, but no more hacking, okay? While some information has emerged during the years about the sensors and the systems, we still have a sketchy picture. For example, we don't know about the sensor fusions or the electronic warfare capabilities, even though we know that the aircraft is equipped with an indigenous data link. The cockpit is a modern all-glass cockpit with a large panoramic head-up display integrated with the helmet-mounted display. The helmet can be used to display the images from a distributed aperture system with four sensors, two on the front of the aircraft near the cockpit and two on the back of the aircraft. These DAS systems are becoming increasingly common, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's true, Otis, even though the pilot's response has been lukewarm at times. The configuration of the other optical systems is not entirely clear because the sources differ. The aircraft has a chin-mounted optical window that really looks like the uh, F-35 EOTS, but it should house an infrared search and track because we have Chinese sources mentioning an Erst and there's pretty much no other place where it could be housed. Some other sources mention two separate systems, one called the NEOTS and the other one the infrared search and track. I personally think the first one is correct, but we don't know for sure. 
The radar is an AESA system credited with a large number of elements, up to 2000 according to some sources, and it is believed to have really good performances. Some analysts believe that the aircraft may have side-looking and rear-facing antennas, but yet we have no confirmation of that. In the same way, there are several panels on the J-20 that could be antenna housing, but their function is actually unknown. Chaffs and flares dispensers are mounted in the fairings at the root of the vertical stabilizers and in the same fairings there seems to be even more antennas uh, that we can only suppose that are related to the electronic warfare and the radar warning systems but again their exact function is unknown. The aircraft doesn't have a cannon and all the armament is stored in the ventral main bay and in two smaller side bays. There are four underwing hardpoints but they have never been seen carrying anything other than fuel tanks for ferry flights. The main role of the J-20 seems to be air superiority and the weapons of choice are the PL-12 medium range and the PL-15 long range missiles. Four units can be carried in the main bay. We know that the Chinese have achieved supersonic payload separation, so definitely these uh, missiles can benefit from a launch at high speed. The new PL-21, which is a long-range air breathing weapon, seems also to be compatible with the J-20. The two side bays house a one PL-10 each. It is a infrared guided short-range weapon. There is a curious detail here. The side bays uh, close immediately after exposing the weapon, leaving it hanging from the side of the aircraft just before the launch. The air-to-ground weapon seems to be limited to the smaller uh, representatives of the LS family. These are pretty much the standard guided bombs in service with the Chinese Air Force. These are gliding bombs and there are various versions, either with inertial guidance, GPS guidance or laser guidance. You may have noticed that the panoply available to the J-20 is actually relatively limited. From this relatively limited variety of weapons, it seems justified the assumption that the J-20 is designed to snipe at the high-value assets of the Western Air Forces, like the OACs, the electronic reconnaissance aircraft, the tankers, and so on. It really seems reasonable that the main mission of the J-20 is to stacking the typical force multipliers available to a modern air force. And another possible target to snipe at long distance are the air-to-ground assets of an attacking force, which won't be capable of defending themselves at long range. In both these scenarios, the capability of getting relatively close to the target thanks to stealth, but also using long-range weapons, well, just makes sense. In the same way, it makes sense to use the aircraft to attack high-paying ground targets with precision-guided weapons, which is basically also the mission where stealth actually shines. And the flip side of this approach is that the actual air combat is probably best left to the flankers, and China has a lot of them. And if you want to learn more about the Chinese Air Force, please click on the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching, and see you there.